uh, so Andreas is kind of We're our live. guy in charge. Oh, is it? Oh, We're live. Yay. Yep. We are live. Delightful. So um, I, I, it's like, wow, what a, what a gathering. We've got not only several of the people that were very involved in this, but uh, uh, we've also got Peter Vandenberg. Uh, he's the batch box guy, but so he's the math guy for rocket mass heaters. Plus, Paul, we've lost you. Your sound went away. Oh. Now uh, now you're back. It says the host has unmuted the mic. So damn it, Andreas, what the hell? <laughs> so I guess he was shutting me down. Okay. The, the thing I'm trying to say is that not only do we have many of the people that were very involved in this build uh, here today, Yay, thanks for coming, everybody. But uh, on top of that, Peter Vandenberg is here. And I was trying to say that uh, uh, if I ever say anything that Peter doesn't agree with, Peter Peter is not bashful about expressing his difference of opinion. And uh, and and he'll and he'll want to get into it. So this is but but I think that this is important. Peter, and when Peter and I get into it, some people have observed and they feel like I'm bullying Peter, and I feel like I don't. I feel like I'm bullying Peter. I feel like he and I are having a respectful exchange, but uh, uh, I, I've always thought of it as very respectful. I, I hold Peter in extremely high regard, and I'm not trying to bully him in any way. In fact, I want him to come out here more often. So, in fact, I don't even go so far as to say I think Peter's a friend. And when Peter hurt himself, I took him to the hospital. Peter got to learn all about American healthcare. <laughs> I got to I got the biggest lesson because uh, I paid the bill. <laughs> so, all right. Uh he's and Peter you're muted. You're muted. I can I see your lips moving. I can't hear anything you're I saying. See. Now you now you're not muted. What is it? You were saying? Okay. What what I want to say is the American healthcare is about 10 times as costly as the uh, the healthcare in the Netherlands. I, I believe it. I that that's that's easy to believe. Um, yeah. Uh, but okay, <clears throat> let's let's go. Today's whatever this is is it, this is a kind of a podcast. It's kind of a video thing. It's we're trying out some of our fancy new video gear, um, and uh, whatever this thing is, um, the the thing I want to focus on is the library build and. Um, the and it's not even a build it's it's an overhaul so uh uh over a little over a year ago we we uh kind of took apart uh some of the the rocket mass heater in the library and uh we implemented a lot of changes and i i am um first of all i want to say that uh you know I'm going to say a rocket mass heater will heat your home with one tenth the wood and different rocket mass heater people might have a different number there. Um, and uh, I think uh, I, I think some of the rocket mass heater people give me the stink eye when I say it because they think my numbers are a little too ambitious. And I've had some people who built rocket mass heaters who switched from an old school wood stove to a rocket mass heater express that um one tenth is not ambitious enough for their experience so they they're experiencing better than one one tenth they're they're heating their home with less than one tenth of the wood uh i'd love to talk about that a lot but i i i want to say that um despite that and and even though we're getting way better than that we're doing we're doing one tenth the wood or better uh, I, I want to say I am obsessed with getting even better still, which I think from a political standpoint or from a marketing standpoint is really dumb. I think that more people will enjoy rocket mass heaters or believe it. Uh, Mud, Mud keeps telling me to say a rocket mass heater heats your home with less than half the wood. He wants me to say that, which is true. 
but I am such an engineer and I am, I don't know, I'm stuck on one tenth. Okay. I think we've done a very good job of optimizing the burn. And when we optimize the burn, one way of being able to show that optimization is about how little heat is going outside combined with how complete the burn is. And so rather than trying to do an inefficient burn at night, we do a very efficient burn through the day. And then, uh, so that part is doing very good. But, but now with this, what we're talking about today, it's gonna to be about efficiency when there is not a fire. That's gonna be our focus for today. Now, I wanna go over some quick notes before we jump into the particulars of this particular uh, overhaul that we did. This was October, 2022. And forgive me while I touch on something political for just a moment. And that is that just before this event started, there was a war in Europe uh, such that people of Europe weren't going to be getting natural gas from Russia. And, uh, and that because of that, natural gas was going to become very scarce. And so uh, um, there was even some predictions that the cost to heat your home with natural gas was going to become $20,000 per month to heat your home mm -hmm. with natural gas. Um, and uh, so we got this idea here of like, let's do a simple build and we'll video it, and then we'll put it up on YouTube and show it to everybody so they can see how to make a quick and simple build so that they'll be able to have, so they'll be able to be warm uh, instead of paying $20,000 a month for heat. Um, now, I know that I uh, went on to Reddit and I tried to talk about this and um, shortly afterwards, shortly after we did this event, and um, uh, in the first hour, interest was big. People were very excited about rocket mass heaters. The questions were good. And um, this was rather fun. And uh, then the uh, corporate trolls and their bot army found me and everything was obliterated. And it's like, well, why? Who's who's going to, who's paying for this bot army and these corporate trolls? And then it became clear about a week and a half later. Um, uh, apparently, several large tankers from the United States, full of natural gas, arrived in Europe, and Europe paid ten times the going rate for these this American natural gas, and they uh, decided to subsidize the natural gas with tax monies. So that way the public just keeps paying the same thing. Anyway, uh, uh, I, th I thought we were doing a very cool thing. Okay, all right. Um, so there's where the big money was. So we did this kind of event, this, uh, I, I thought of it as a peasant workshop. Um, there were a lot of people who were there to, to lead that were not paid. And there were uh, some people there who had some skills that didn't pay to be there. Uh, we did uh, hire a cook so people could eat. Um, anyway, it was a peasant workshop. Uh, and uh, we had, I don't know, I think about a dozen people here or something like that, maybe less than a dozen. Um, and uh, uh, all of whenever we do the peasant workshop stuff, it's free or cheap. Uh, I think we did sell like three or four tickets for something like four hundred dollars or something, a very low, low price. Um, and then, uh, and then all of the boots in the boot camp joined in, and uh, and we had three, three builds, and this was one of the three. And Isaac ran point uh, at the beginning, and. Uh, uh, and then um, uh, Elliot kind of took the last day with Alex, uh, something like that. Am I am I re recalling this correctly, everybody? Isaac, Alex. Yeah, I think that's correct, Paul. Okay. All right. All right. Or close enough. Everybody's getting credit. 
So uh, I've just got a text from Stephen saying, could someone please send him the meeting link? And so if, if anybody's got that, that'd be, that'll be handy. Okay. Um, let's see. Ah, um, now I, I, I just want to talk for a moment because, because part of what happened is, is, is that for all three builds, none of them were done when the event was over. And then, uh, uh, in fact, you know, you'd think like, oh, well, they'll all be wrapped up in the next couple of days by the boot camp. And it's like, but the boot camp only had a couple, had a few people in it. it wasn't very many. It was like, I think four or five people in the boot camp right then. And, and of course, there's all kinds of other projects that boot camp works on. And in the end, these projects didn't get finished for a year. So it took a year until the projects were all, were all three, all, all done. And then we could get the last little bits of video. Now, uh, another thing is, is that we, we said a thing uh, to, we asked everybody to take lots and lots of video. And uh, we tried to keep all of the things that we were doing pretty simple uh, because we, we were thinking we're going to save Europe. And, uh, uh, and so there was, yeah, yeah, Peter's over there cackling because it's like, uh, a <laughs> bunch of yeah. Americans think they're going to help Europe. So uh, anyway, um, uh, that we thought, so we, so people did, they, they put a lot of effort into taking video and, and it's like, the idea is we're going to put this all up on YouTube for free. And um, <sighs> it took a long time to get them done. And then we needed the last bits of video. And, uh, but, but I think we finally got the last bits of video in and, and then it's kind of like, okay, now we need to do the editing. And uh, Andreas is uh, going into the editing and it's kind of like, okay, well, how do we pay for the editing that's, that's going to be done? And, uh, um, and there's still some stuff to be, still some, some work to be done. We need to record a little bit more. We need to come up with our intro and, and things of that nature. And there's, there's still some stuff to be done. But <clears throat> um. In order to figure this all out, we, we want to be respectful to the people that did the recording. And I think we came up with a solution. And if anybody objects, now is a great time to say something. Uh, and it kind of goes like this. Um, we will put all the video up. Well, we will put uh, tight versions up on YouTube. So we originally thought that, that the three builds we broken down into 12 YouTube bits. And so we will put up. 12 YouTube bits. And then we'll have an extended version of the whole thing available for sale on Permies. And and uh, if anybody objects, now's a great time to say something. But, you know, hopefully by selling this, this will be a way that we can pay for the editing. And so if any, I, I think we came up with a nice solution. So we're still going to get it up on YouTube and it'll all be there. Um, but it'll be the, you know, the tight version. Um, so the extended version will be available on um, for sale. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. All of my designs here. Oh, for all the things that we do here, uh, is is for the boot camp. Uh, for, and and we're kind of designed for there to be more than a dozen people in the boot camp. And so when we're less than a dozen, then everything kind of moves very slowly. Um, but the boot camp has been low on boots the last couple of years, so everything is slow. Uh, we used to have ringers stopping by several times a year, like Ernie and Erica would stop by a good three times a year. And we had a, a whole bunch of other people. Thomas Elpole would stop by a lot. He's going to be here for the Garden Master course, which is next week. Uh, but of course, Helen Atta would stop by several times a year. We had all kinds of people who are just, you know, permaculture bigs coming through. Uh, they would stop and help and do stuff and show, demonstrate, whatever. Uh, and then we'd have people that are cooks that would stop by and whip up feasts for the boots. That's always fun. And then we'd had uh, a lot of seppers stop by, people who would rent a cabin and they had skills and they would hang out for a couple of weeks and help out. Um, so uh, th these are the things that we're, we're hoping to expand on, but, but it is what it is. And so that makes it's, it's made this whole thing happen much, much slower than we'd hoped for. When there's not many people in the boot camp, everything kind of goes a lot slower. Um, 
All right. The movie is going to be called Freaky Cheap Heat. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Uh, all right. That's all of my notes from there. Then, okay, Andreas, do you have that 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 uh, that pit? I'm gonna I'm gonna basically so so I posted about this immediately after the event about all the things that we did in the library because I think it's so important. And uh, and I and also uh, I got to look at at all of the video that we took of this build. Uh, edited down into something uh, about uh, 30 minutes long, maybe a little, maybe 40 minutes long that uh, Andreas put together with all the video that people took. Um, and uh, uh, I, I think it's, I think it's fun. I think it's, it's very, very fun. And, uh, and of course we've shared a, at least one piece of this build already when we were doing the Kickstarter for the low tech laboratory movie too. And uh, so um all right. All right. And then when I posted this, then Peter replied. And and he he made some comments, but but what I want to do is I want to talk about the things, the modifications that we made. Uh first of all, I want to say we took out the guillotine and uh uh so basically what we had was a physical plug in the ceiling. Oh, there, look, Andreas has got it up. You can see it, this physical plug that uh, we have uh, uh, right up at the ceiling. So when we're all done and and the burn is all done, we can plug that. And uh, that way it, it makes sure that it's not drawing air from the room into the wood feed throughout the entire system, including throughout the mass and taking that heat outside, thus slowly cooling the mass. And so it's a physical plug. And we found that there were, uh, well, one, one giant problem with a part A and a part B. And uh, I understand somebody took this thing I'm about to say, and they uh, they say that this is oh, it's Alan Booker says that that it's like the Paul Wheaton axiom or something. I I don't know, but anyway, I'm going to say the thing, and it goes like this: Whenever you design a system to de to depend on human discipline, that is your failure point. And so, in order for this plug to work then when the burn is done, you need to activate the plug. You need to plug the plug. <laughs> and, and so if you don't remember to do that, then you haven't gained anything by having it there. And so what we learned was is that three quarters of the time, people would forget to plug the plug. And so it wouldn't, it wouldn't do the thing it was designed to do. But even worse, <laughs> as if somebody remembered to activate the plug, but then they forgot when they started the fire. Now, a rocket mass heater will run perfectly for about two minutes <laughs> before uh, it, 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 uh, the, it, it finds the plug or the plug overwhelms it. And then the system starts backing up and it starts coming smoke in the room. <clears throat> so a lot of people, they'll start the fire and it's like it starts crackling and everything's going great. And they're like, oh, good. I'm all done. I'm going to go over to this other building and do this other thing. And I'll come back and put some, some more firewood in in about 20 minutes, half an hour, something like that. And then they'll come back and the building's full of smoke because the plug is still plugged. And it's like that's that is having that happen even one time is absolutely unacceptable. And so it's like this, this thing, this plug, it, it's like everybody is certain that they have perfect human discipline until they are proven that they don't. <laughs> and so uh, we took this out. This is, this is absolutely unacceptable. However, the idea is very good. Now let's set the idea aside. 
There was a second experiment in this. Well, actually two more experiments in this that we also removed. Um, I think one of them had already been removed. The, the outdoor air intake, we'd already removed that. But yeah, this one here is the bypass. Now, um, fascinating thing about the bypass. So the, the idea of the bypass is, is um, to have the exhaust coming out of the manifold and then uh, you can either choose to have it go the normal way, which was a ducting loop-de-loop -loop to heat the mass and then up and out the vertical exhaust, or you could activate the bypass, which would bypass the mass. And then the exhaust would go straight out the vertical exhaust. So fascinating thing. The idea was that if you activate the bypass when you're starting the rocket mass heater, then you're going to get uh, a much stronger draw when you're starting it. And then when you deactivate the bypass, then it's going to go through the mass, which has got a longer path to go through. But by then, the vertical exhaust is already warmed up. The fire is already pushing hard. Everything will work great. Um, I think that that is true, that the desired effect was totally true. But I don't know, it might have helped like 8%. It wasn't enough to be worth it. But we, we discovered another benefit that was pretty fascinating. And that was that when the fire is down to just coals, you could activate the bypass. And then if uh, it starts pulling air through the system, then it doesn't pull it from the mass. It just pulls it from the firebox. <clears throat> So in a way, it adds a little bit of efficiency to the overall system, maybe maybe 10% efficiency, something like that, which, you know, still that's something, and that is a fascinating, interesting thing. But once again, in order for it to work correctly, it depends on human discipline. And so um, uh, basically, if anybody ever happened to activate the bypass at some point, they would generally forget. And then when the fire would go out, the building would get cold really fast because the, ma the mass hadn't been charged. And it's like, oh, right. It's because I forgot about the bypass. And so there's there was that. So um, the, the upsides did not outweigh the downsides. So during this rebuild, <clears throat> we took that out. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, uh, so those were two experiments and I, I gotta say, I don't recommend a, a bypass ever. Uh, and, and we had a really excellent bypass here too. It was a very well-made bypass. Um, but I, I think that if you're ever trying to design a system, and you're trying to design in a bypass, I don't know, I would put a red flag in it. Like that's probably not a good idea, but uh, people still do it. Uh, but I think I would discourage the use of a bypass. I know we're not gonna use any more bypasses here. I can't think of a reason to ever have one um, where, where the upsides will outweigh the downsides. Uh, Peter, you know, you probably get no. a lot of people wanting to put in bypasses. Do you ever do bypasses anymore? No. Yeah, I, I think that it's true. And, uh, and, and I think that uh, now the, <clears throat> the next thing we did that is a big part of this improvement of this system overhaul is uh, we took out the duct, which was in a loop-de-loop, -loop, and we put in uh, a stratification chamber. It's a two barrel stratification chamber. And, uh, and this is the, uh, the idea is to keep more heat in the system and also to have the, uh, the 
only the cooler gases go out the exhaust. Now. Uh, uh, wait a minute. Yeah. Whole barrels? Yeah, whole oh. barrels. No half barrels. No half barrels. Oh, okay. okay, I see. This I see. is a very tall mass. Yeah. Yeah, we're not going to have anybody sitting on this. It's too tall to sit on. I mean, people have sat on it, but it's like, it's a very tall mass. Mm -hmm. So yeah, two, two whole barrels. And, uh, uh, I, you know, I'm sure Isaac is still here, uh, but uh, I think those were welded together. Is that correct? Those two barrels? I think it looks like Isaac, you're muted. Can is, I don't know if you unmute or if Andreas has to unmute you. Can you hear me? Now I can hear you. Yeah, I believe you're right. I think we, uh, I remember we welded those together um, to create one massive barrel. Okay. And so that's going to be one giant stratification chamber. Now, what, I've, what I'm trying to do here is like, think about it this way. The, the idea of that physical plug is a good idea like just in your head <clears throat> but but because of the human discipline factor it becomes a dumb idea so it's kind of like all right well how do we make a plug in the system that's relatively passive so now a, a, a thing that i think is is really delightful for a j-tube system is that a lot of times when the fire is completely out you just move the bricks over the j-tube and that's a pretty good plug right there uh it's not perfect it's a leaky plug um although uh here inside of the uh, fisher price house uh somebody made a plug for uh for this that's working very well it's a very good very thorough plug so the great thing about putting bricks over the wood feed like there you can see uh bricks sitting next to the wood feed but when the fire is completely out and putting the bricks over the wood feed is um, uh, it's it's a, a good a good plug. But the great thing is, is that when you go to start the fire the next day, you're going to always move the bricks aside. It's not like you're going to try and shove sticks into the wood feed while the bricks are in the way. In order to get the sticks in there, you got to or even put the paper in there, you got to move the bricks out of the way. So this is kind of uh it, it's working with human beings it's working with uh the the way that all this stuff kind of has to be done that's the thing i really like about it now hope i can i can i can feel peter talking about wanting to say something about batch box systems and and being able to plug those but but let's let's circle back to that a little later the the thing is is that it's like all right how do we get the efficiency of the physical plug like we had with the guillotine, but passively, something that's done automatically. Now, uh, you know, when we start talking about this, a lot of people get ideas about like different kinds of electronic mechanisms <laughs> that open and close things, depending on different scenarios. Like when you move the brick, it activates this detector, which then triggers a, a the plug to open or something like that. And it's like, I think those have a, those, those got failure written all over them. So it's kind of like, uh, all right, what can we do to kind of plug things? Now, a fascinating thing to keep in mind is that uh, your J-tube style rocket mass heater has a riser and a barrel over the riser. And hot gases are kind of like upside down water and plumbing. So the hot gases want to rise. And so when the fire is out, but there's still heat in the system, the heat tends to rise up into the barrel above the riser and it doesn't want to come down. So in a way we call this a P-trap effect, but the, but the hot air gets stuck. It's, it's sort of plugged, sort of, kind of, a little bit. Not exactly, not entirely, but pretty much, kind of. It's a plug. It's a, a naturally occurring plug. So as long as there is warm air in the system, warm and cold air in the system, it wants to stratify 
and it wants to kind of not move, stop moving. It's a kind of a plug. Now, when we do a stratification chamber, it sort of does a similar sort of a thing. So you've got a, a big tank. You've got a big tank, and then you've got your exhaust coming down inside the tank, going down near the bottom. So now the hot gases are stuck near the top of the tank, and the cooler gases are at the bottom. But the cooler gases have to be warm enough in order to be able to go up the vertical exhaust. And they might not be. And so the warmer those vertical gases are, the stronger the draw will be to go up the vertical exhaust, the stronger the thermosiphon. Now, um, by introducing this stratification chamber, <coughs> then we've introduced uh, something that's a bit of a passive plug to the system. So we already had one passive plug, which was inside the barrel. Now we have a new passive plug, which is inside the stratification chamber. But wait, there's one more. And this is something that uh, Peter and I talked about the last time he was here. And I, I said something about what if I took an eight inch rocket mass heater and I put a four inch vertical exhaust on it, you know, then while the fire was running, would that work? And he and I talked about it for about 15 minutes. And in the end, he believed it would. I was convinced it would. And then we tried it out here uh, during our last rocket mass heater jamboree a little more than two years ago. And it did not go well. Um, there was too much laminar flow. And so there's too much friction in the system. Uh, but we did, we switched to six inch. So we had an eight inch system with a six inch vertical exhaust. And that system worked pretty good. And so this is kind of our new standard now. So what we did was, is that there was an eight inch exhaust on this rocket mass heater and we switched it out to a six inch vertical exhaust. Now when the gases are cool, they don't really want to move through that six inch very well. Whereas when the gases were cool, they were pretty happy to move through that eight inch vertical exhaust. So <clears throat> what we want is when the system is cool, we want to plug the system as much as we can. And so, um, we, we switched out to this six inch system, the six inch vertical exhaust. And then the other thing that we did is we moved the six inch vertical exhaust right next to the barrel. We call this kiss the barrel. And uh, the idea is that when there is a fire going, then the heat from the barrel will heat that vertical exhaust, thus improving the thermosiphon that's happening inside that vertical exhaust. So we have a stronger draw when we have a fire and we have a very plugged draw when we don't have a fire. This is the design. Um, I, I don't know if we put enough mileage in it. Now, Steven's here. Steven's been using it a lot. Steven, did you use the old system much before you used the the new system uh i had a little practice with the old system but uh after the rocket mass heater workshop uh it's it seems to have worked much 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 better i also never had a chance to use the guillotine before it was removed or the bypass before it was removed i've only oh, yeah. seen the parts to it so. okay all right i think another big thing you know it's it's i i think the thing i want to do is explore the idea of like, uh, you know, is it holding heat better? Is it is it radiating heat better long term? However, there's a bit of a of a a problem in asking for that kind of analysis. In that, um, like when you watch the video as we're making these modifications you'll when the camera goes up to the ceiling you'll notice that there is no ceiling 
So basically, uh, there was there were some bats of insulation that you could see, but they didn't always meet, and so there was a, it was a very leaky ceiling um, because what's above that insulation is open to the outdoors, and so it's like, uh, and then now we have a ceiling in there, so it's kind of like, and we can see it like in the background of uh, where Stephen is right now, kind of above Stephen's head. You could kind of see that there's a ceiling in there now. What a what a thing! What an idea! A ceiling, <laughs> and so that is probably making the the whole rocket mass heater about three times more efficient right there. Um, the key is is that uh, I don't think we have a really great way of being able to measure how effective all these plugs are being. All right. I've now dumped a bunch of things, um, but at the same time, Isaac, you were the one that was in charge of this build. Uh, before I go on to any of my other notes, um, this is a great time for you to talk about the build that you were in charge of. Now, you did skip out on us on the last day, and you, yeah. you, you which is fair. I mean, I believe your pay for this was zero dollars and zero cents. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. yeah, and then there was that. And uh, uh, but Elliot stepped up and he he took it over. In fact, it was it was Elliot and Alex working together to kind of keep the the ball rolling on this. But uh, Isaac, now is a good time for you to say your bit about this build. Uh, well. I, the only thing I can talk about is kind of what we did uh, because I didn't get to experience, you know, being la leaving, I didn't really get to see the results of it. We'd have to ask Steven more for that, but uh, uh, it was, it was pretty, you know, we just turned this system a lot. It was, it's a lot more simple after we got done with it. We took that barrel, we welded it together. Um, we laid that in, the existing uh, wood structure and then out of our burn chamber and our uh, barrel for the the riser we had a just so people understand we had another piece of uh, uh, pipe of eight inch pipe that went to the very end of that barrel and that's so that people know that that the, the gases weren't just going into the stratification chamber and then going right out the right out the uh, exhaust, which are right next to each other. The hot gases were going to the very end there, and then making their way to the to the juice box and out to the uh, uh, exhaust. So I think that's uh, so people know that that's uh, pretty good as far as as far as the design. Uh, what else? That kiss the barrel idea worked pretty good uh, on the build we did before that. What's the other room there, Paul? Uh, the solarium? You... Yeah, the solarium. Seemed to work very good there, huh? Have you seen your starring role in that movie? Have you have you been able to look at yourself, you know, prancing and dancing in that in that movie, building that have, solarium build? I haven't. I had a lot of fun with it. In fact, I was just looking at some uh, – some of the diagrams and whatnot you had for that. And I think it's pretty cool. That was a pretty fun build. Anyways, that, that, that kiss the barrel, I think worked so well that we, we tried to get it as close as we could to implement it for, for this, uh, fixing the library build. And I think that, I think that helps a lot. Uh, like I said, we'll have to ask Steven how the results are, because that's the one unfortunate thing of being there and building it is not being there every, every day to be able to see how, how good or how bad it runs, you know? Right. Um, I think that, uh, I think, I think that immediately after Elliot's Elliot and Alex were done that, uh, when people would go to burn it and, and fire it up, it worked better than before because it was a little picky and snotty before. Um, it worked quite good, but, I mean, like the one that's inside the Fisher Price house is dreamy. Oh, such a strong draw every time. It's like uh, it's so then suddenly everything else kind of gets compared to that. 
Um, I've I've been to some other sites where they have rocket mass heaters, and I kind of feel like ours are generally way better than I, than the ones at these other sites. You're as, in, studying. as in as in I'm just curious, as in a stronger draw or yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Oh, a stronger draw makes all the difference, and. Uh, yeah. Uh, and and I've I've had I've been to places where people are like oh Paul Wheaton come and look at my rocket mass heater it's so great I love it so much, and I kind of feel like it has a weak draw, and uh, I you know and I kind of feel a little snotty myself like yeah, <laughs> your draw is kind of weak you know, and uh, so then the one in the library. Uh, it had a pretty good draw, but not as good as the Fisher Price House. And I think that was part of what we wanted is like, okay, how do we make it plug when there is no fire, but have a stronger draw when there is a fire? Yeah. And and, uh, and you and Elliot and Alex put a lot of work in, into that. And then when we were burning it after the event, so after everybody had left, it did seem like it was better, but I think a lot of us were still feeling a little snotty because the one in the Fisher Price house is still better, like a lot better. And mm. it's like, so uh, um, I, Elliot was here this last fall, and I believe it was a suggestion from Fred to uh, extend the... Um, uh, the vertical exhaust over the roof. And uh, <clears throat> once that went in, the draw got much stronger. But uh, Elliot, Elliot and Alex, I know that you guys made a bunch of changes uh, after Isaac left to get a stronger draw during the burn. And uh, because there was this thing of like, you know, we want we just want the draw to be even stronger still than what we were experiencing. Do you remember what all you did? Yeah, I remember the first thing we did was um, we increased the height of the bell over the riser, so we increased that gap. That was the first thing we did. Uh, I think that the old gap was a solid two inches, mm -hmm. which Ianto Evans, his whole thing was. If you do a gap of an inch and a half, that's so you could boil your your tea water on top of the barrel quickly. And uh, at two inches, it's if you don't care about that 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 water, that hot water, that boiling that water. And uh, and so two inches kind of became a norm. But then the work of Peter, at least it with at least here, he he's got that one down in the classroom that has like. Uh, the gap above the riser is more like, I don't know, two and a half feet. <laughs> and oh, it's man. like, it's like, about oh. The, about the yard. <laughs> you're saying yard because you're really thinking a meter. Is that right? Yes. To, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's about the yard. <laughs> a yard. I know. Okay. It, actually, uh, there are two barrels above the riser there. And uh, the top gap between riser and top of the barrel is about a whole barrel a little more than so, a whole barrel a little more than one barrel high yeah and it's so big. i i think that what we were thinking was well when there's a fire we want a strong draw and if we make that gap bigger then we will get it it'll be it'll be less of an impediment so less friction yeah and and so uh so you made that gap i believe four inches and then i i think that that did help but we wanted yeah. even more yeah i think the next uh, thing we did was we changed the contour of the juice box straw bottom uh i think you know isaac do you remember what you implemented initially uh, uh I don't understand what you're asking. Sorry. So the no straw, problem. there's a straw oh, the vertical inside of inside of the it. double barrel. Yeah. 
And so, so what that, was the shape of the straw? Like what angle did you cut? The, so there's that pipe coming down. That's the vertical oh, yeah. of the straw. And so what was the bottom of the straw like? Our hope was just where you had this barrel was the straw was naturally offset because you also had that horizontal uh, tube or horizontal pipe going to the back of the barrel. So we had the challenge was to fit them both in the space of that barrel. And so the thought was if we can just kind of guess and cut it at the same angle as the sort of the barrel as it slopes in because it's towards the edge there, that was what we were going for. And that's what we had kind of cut it uh, for. Yeah, I think um, I think we changed like we we did some adjustment there um, in terms of like the direction that it was angled. And then we also pulled it up and down to see uh, like at what level um, we could get a better draw without yeah. sacrificing too much um, efficiency. Yeah, I, I think that uh, if I remember correctly, you moved it up several inches and you changed the angle so it would be like like it would pull more from the bottom. And uh, um, <clears throat> and then that worked that that did make for mm -hmm. a better draw. At least that's my my memory. Yeah. And, and if I may, uh, you know, one of the things that's kind of fun about the system is, you know, when it's open, I mean, first of all, using the cob um, around the barrel you know, it was easy to just create a two inch ring of cob. I mean, say easy, but relatively Add a easy, bit right? More. And we just keep you know, building it up and Alex supervised all that lovely. And, uh, and you let that sit there and then you plunk the barrel on top of it. And then you say, oh, is that enough? And, you know, and then you're like, hey, I think that's better. Okay, well, if we needed to make it a little taller, we could have made it taller. If it was like, oh, well, you know, maybe we've exceeded what we need. Well, you could scrape it off. You know, it's not a big deal. Um, and then when it came to uh, fiddling with the uh, juice box design itself, you can kind of see from the photo that's up right there is that the um, the the grave there uh, for the barrels, uh, in which would then be filled with all of the pebbles and other <laughs> rock, um, the, the, you know, the tall open. bench area. Yeah, the tall <laughs> bench area. I think of it as a grave. It's just anyway. Yeah, you know, it's <laughs> you just bury it in there. For a minute. <laughs> um, but because that's open, it was relatively easy. It wasn't super simple because it's not designed to be really adjustable. But while it's open, it was pretty straightforward to go in there and take that that tube, the juice box, and rotate it. A little bit and i think we kind of ended up rotating it about 90 degrees so that it faced more of the the downslope side of things and then also just oh. lift it up and down a little bit and then you go outside and you look at the smoke coming out and you're like what does that look like you know is it should drawing it better or is it drawing worse yeah and should so we, should you we know, try a little higher go, should we go a little lower and then we retest and so it's a really easy system to tune in one sense because you can look at it. You don't have to have the fancy, and you can do it, but you don't have to have the fancy oxygen sensors looking at what's coming out of the exhaust and so forth. You can just look at what's coming out of the roof and go, does that look better than it looked before? Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's a fair amount of time standing out there going, huh, uh, I think we need to do something more. And we go on in and do it and then, you know, throw some more wood in and like, hmm, that looks better. All right. And then, you know, continue on. So it, it's, a, yeah. it's a nice low tech and responsive system in that way. Yeah. But, you know, it took a little bit of time management to, uh, to end a test and allow the whole system to cool down so that we could start again in the same situation. Um, there are a few things I wanted to that that jogged my memory as Elliot was talking about <laughs> um, a, a lot of that is a, the cob around uh, the base of the bell. We actually found in, right now in Stephen's uh, background, you can see kind of the fire glistening. You see a bit of like this um, orange reflection. Uh, that area, we, we found that we should have removed a little extra cob because it was a little too close to the intake. <laughs> so that, <laughs> so that, was, that was a lesson learned there. Um, and then there was a point of clarification um, on the description of the exhaust from the bell, so the horizontal exhaust. 
from the combustion to the mass area. In my, in my very fancy um, sketch here, um, I noted that it went uh, a little um, a little under halfway. So 40 inches um, in the overall is 83 inches. So a little under halfway, it, it, the exhaust ended. And I'm pretty sure in order to prevent it from, you know, dropping down too much and sitting on the bottom, did we put something there like a brick or something just to- I think you're it? right. Yeah, yeah. I okay, didn't note anything there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're talking about the uh, from the manifold into mm -hmm. the stratification chamber, right? We're yep, talking about right. the pipe mm -hmm. sitting in there. Okay, all right. <clears throat> yeah. So the the trouble is so the, so a lot of people use the word bell, which comes from masonry heaters, and uh, yeah. unfortunately, it can mean so many different things in what we're doing. And I shouldn't even use the word barrel. There's like uh, uh, mud. Mud thinks we should use the word radiator. You know, mm -hmm. the radiator yeah, yeah. is is this part which is usually a barrel but sometimes it's not and then there's the stratification chamber uh no, note it's not the bell it's the stratification chamber uh just so that we can because vocabulary really makes a big difference about a lot of this stuff but yeah, thanks okay. i agree all right all right um i i think that uh uh in the end uh the uh, so elliot was here and then he stuck an insulated extension onto the uh, vertical exhaust and that seems to have made a big difference um and now it's now it has a good strong draw and and i want to just you know for everybody who's ever been here if we build something and there is like if if there's still like you go to start the fire and there's still smoke in a minute what do we tend to do it's like, I okay. I'll just answer my own question. We're Open either, a window. <laughs> we're we're either not done with this rocket mass heater, or we're gonna tear the whole thing out. So, the red cabin. I mean, I gotta say, like that thing that um, that donkey built. The the I think he called it the cyclone. Uh, what a beautiful thing! Oh, it, it was so handsome, uh, but um we kept making modifications to it to try to get it to burn cleaner and in the end it's like we think we could do it but it's going to require five more modifications mm -hmm. but these but but it's just the experiments just go on and on and on and on and we finally decided to take it out which is very sad because it was so beautiful but uh there's been other things where we put them in and we just can't get them to burn clean so yeah, you guys were talking about going out there and staring at the the exhaust. And if there's smoke coming out the exhaust, it's like, that won't work. You know, we got to, and it's like, we usually give it a minute to clear up. And uh, which is better for a convention than a conventional wood stove. But if it is still smoke after a minute, it's like, this is not a rocket mass heater. It is not working. And either something has to change or we got to take this whole design out and go with something else. So fortunately, the the uh, one in the library now burns very clean, even cleaner than before. So, yeah. Uh, uh, Paul, if I may, and, and Andres, if you could toss up the photos of the roof chimney. Um, we just kind of ran out of time. Um, at the end of that particular build. And what we see there is the extension that I put on. And yeah, there it was before. And the before one, well, boy, there are a couple of things there which one might think are suspect. One is, boy, it's going to be hard for that thing to breathe if you get a lot of snow. Second, it's a little too low for the roof line. And so uh, generally you want to have this above the roof line so that it doesn't have weird winds swirling around it. And so we knew that was uh, the case. And then when I was there last fall, I went and found, um, it was a bit of a scavenger hunt, but I found one. And uh, now we can go to the after photo, Andreas, uh, put that extension on there. And to all um, accounts that has really improved it, um, both because it has a taller draw now and you just get a slightly better stack effect the air exiting just has more time to accelerate um and move up that 
And then also it's just in a better position vis-a-vis -vis the wind and the roof line and stuff like that. And so again, another small modification um, to the system which has improved it. Yeah, and, and, it, and another important thing is this is a six inch exhaust on an eight inch J-tube system. And mm -hmm. uh, I think the draw is now stronger probably because of the kiss the barrel uh, and you know what the uh, the gases have a shorter path now um, they just stratify in the stratification chamber so that's probably helping a bit during the burn as well but we're getting a stronger draw with a six inch vertical exhaust over an eight inch and I like to think that the whole system is kind of plugged a bit now when there is not a fire so i'm not i don't really have a great way of being able to, to show that or demonstrate it but you know i like to think that now uh we now have a really good plug for the fisher price house uh, rocket mass heater maybe we need to make something similar for uh the one in the library one of these days and that'll help to, to have another plug there's another experiment that was done uh, with all these changes. And I, I wonder if anybody wants to talk about that. But we, uh, rather than what was taken out was pebbles and giant boulders. Uh, so the innards of a conventional pebble style rocket mass heater. And, and I gotta say, when we built this, uh, we built three pebble style rocket mass heaters all at the same time. And these were the very first proper rocket, pebble-style rocket mass heaters inside of structures uh, that weren't just temporary experimental things. And so we had a lot to learn from pebble-style. And, and I wanna say pebble-style has turned out to be a huge success. This is just dreamy. Now there is, we, we are guessing that pebble-style is probably about 20% less efficient than Cobb style, than having a Cobb mass. Peter, if you were gonna pick a number about pebble style's efficiency compared to Cobb, what would, what number would you pick? Uh, 10 to 15, I You'd think. But um, the, the thing with pebbles is that, um, it picks up heat not very quickly because there is space between them. Yeah. Uh, so initially, most of the heat is going to the chimney, warming up the chimney, a stronger draw, and when the, um, the uh, heat in the uh, strut chamber or the pipe or whatever it is in the bench, uh, is above uh, temperature of boiling water, then it picks up heat more readily. So to start up a pebble style is easier because of the ready uh, heat that's going to the chimney. The chimney is, uh, is warmed up earlier. And that's why the pebble style in the Fisher Price house is so roaring let's say that so uh, it's still an eight inch uh, chimney there is it paul yeah it is it's still an eight inch uh vertical exhaust yeah, yeah and yeah, yeah. uh and we keep talking about like it's you know we need to overhaul the one the fisher price house to try to make it a little bit more efficient um yeah. and and it's like the the box that it's in is bulging a little bit which my understanding is, is that this box was bulging a little bit. Is that true? No, no. Well, uh, the, the idea is that the pebbles are expanding a bit when they're getting hot. Yes. Ooh, uh, that one I don't know about. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is what bricks do and what sand is doing. Anything that's masonry and so on. So when it's getting hot, it expands. That's it. So the pebbles expand, pushing to the sides, 
then shrinking again by cooling down, expanding again. So the sides are starting to bulge. Some, in, in, not in a year, but probably in five years or more. So you have to, um, to be aware of that, let's say well, that. So here you can see some pictures where uh, some steel straps were added mm -hmm. to try to mitigate future bulging. And, uh, yes. and, and I think that we're going to do a lot more of that with any future pebble style. I mean, uh, I think that Cobb is, is about 20% more efficient. It sounds like Peter is in the 10 to 15% camp. And, yeah. um, uh, but, I, but pebble style has proven to have to be a big win, uh, for a lot of people. It, it brings a whole different aesthetic to the table that some people like more. Um, but, uh, also a big thing that it brings is that is the ability to build it quickly. Like this is probably one third the time to build. Uh, oh, and it's so much easier if you want to make changes, which, you know, is a big part of what we're doing. There's a lot of. I wanted to comment on that because if we'd had to uh, rip off all of the cob that was encasing the uh, previous ducting and then rehydrate all of it, blend it back in and pack it back in, that would have been a real chore. Um, and secondly, because we got a little eager on filling the pebbles back in before we had it properly tuned and then Paul came and caught us. Um, if we'd had to remove wet cob from the system in order to finish the tuning, that would have been even less pleasant. So overall, as a building material, the pebbles are pretty lovely, um, especially for say an initial installation and i could imagine that after the fact one might want to come back and uh cob it um if you were really seeking that extra 10 to uh or 15 to 20 percent efficiency um but boy for for playing around and uh problem solving pebbles boy yeah, that's absolutely uh not only is it preferable to wet cob to have to disassemble or something, but um, to remove the pebbles, you use a vacuum cleaner, which makes it so easy. It's not like you're scooping it out hand by hand. The vacuum cleaner makes it even easier to work with pebbles. And to be clear, we're talking about a shop vac, which you can see in this picture here. Um, yes, not a household. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but you can get the dust out of it with the household one. You got it. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> there is a, probably a fight involved in that one. <laughs> so uh, another big one with a uh, a pebble cell rocket mass heater is that uh, we've done this a few times where it's like uh, like I know that for example. Uh, when I did the demonstration at Karis Park in Missoula in 2010, we had a pebble style rocket mass heater all set up and running in, in a warehouse. And we took it apart and we loaded it up on trailers in less than an hour. And right. then when we got to Karis Park, we built the whole thing in an hour and 10 minutes. So the, the thing is, is that I kind of feel like if you are in a temporary space and you want to take your rocket mass heater with you, a pebble style travels with you really well. You could load it up onto a pickup in about an hour, and then when you get to your new site, you can set it back up again in probably a little more than an hour. So it's uh, it's really delightful that way. Um, it's plausible that if somebody is renting, this could be an option, whereas Cobb might not be an option. So there is some lovely, delightful things. Now, innovation. We tried an experiment on this one. Does anybody want to talk about the experimental uh, cob patch in this? Anybody? Anybody? I, I'll do it if you want. Okay, so. Was there an air leak? No. 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 The yeah, idea. My I can take this, Paul. Okay. Um, so uh, Peter was talking about the issue being that um, with with gravel, you've got these air spaces and you don't have continuous contact also with the barrel. So it's startup 
um, it's kind of insulated in one sense. And so more of the heat goes to moving the air up and out the chimney and creating better draw. Once it hits a certain point, it radiates a little bit better. Um, and then the, the pebbles start to absorb it. So, well, what did we want to do? We wanted to improve the efficiency of the heat transfer from the barrel to uh, essentially keep it as cool as possible in there. And so what we did is on the upper half of the barrel, not mm -hmm. the lower half, just the upper half, which is the hotter mm -hmm. part of it, we um, made up a bunch of cob and then plastered, um, as it were, these rocks onto the barrel. So there's a layer of cob underneath that rock and then slap that rock on. So there's um, a coating, a solid-ish coating of cob and rock on the top half of the barrels um, to improve the heat transfer. So the key is, the reason why cob is more efficient is because it's using conductive heat, which is the most efficient form of heat. Whereas uh, convective heat is the least efficient form of heat. And a pebble style uses convective heat to heat everything. Well, it uses a bit of both, right? Because I mean, where it's touching the barrel, it's got, um, it's got sure. conductive, but then it's got a lot of air gaps. And so, yeah, that way we could remove the air gaps and get rid of the convection part of it. So, uh, and, and where a pebble or a rock touches the barrel, that is conductive heat, but there's not a lot of touchy going on right there. Whereas once you introduce the cob, now there's a lot of touchy going on. And so a lot more conductive heat. So the, the pebble style system has a bunch of holes along the bottom of the bench. So that air can come into the bench and then, uh, then the uh, stratification chamber will will heat the gases surrounding the barrels in there. This that's surrounding the stratification chamber. So, it, so basically, heat comes off and goes into the pebbles and the rocks and things like that. And then it has to move through. If if it can't move through, then it just becomes insulative rather than being um, a heat transfer scenario. So. What you guys did is that you uh, put a bunch of cob on the top of the barrel and kind of glued a bunch of rocks on there with the cob. Ah, oh, what a great photo. You kind of see it happening right there. And then on the sides, you left it as pebbles so that the the air can continue to move up the sides in the, yeah. in the convective way that is necessary in order for that part to work. So the idea is, is to make something that's a little bit of a hybrid system, possibly a little more efficient. Um, so it's a small thing. Will it, will it be a big, big deal? Um, not sure, not sure, but you know, we just got to try. Uh, and at the same time, one of the other builds, they did that too. And so, because they believed in it. I mean, Mud was here, Mud, Mud thinks it's a good idea also. Um, uh, I, I, I think it's probably going to be slightly more efficient. Um, uh, maybe I think it's debatable whether it's worth the extra effort because of course, Cobb, anything you do with Cobb is slow. And, uh, and so it's kind of like, uh, and, and of course, once the Cobb dries, it becomes like a big ass rock and it's like, uh, if we want to make changes, it's it's not going to be as easy to make changes. So, can I add one thing, Paul? Yes. And I think the other benefit of this test is the conversation is kind of like, you know, I think I remember reading in Erica and Ernie's book. It's the, you know, if you don't use the heat, it's uh, useless to have. You know what I mean? And so the conversation is, if we have cob below it or around it that's not getting directly you know if somebody's not sitting on that then how useful is that to you whereas if you have cob on the top that you might may or may not sit on in this situation it's a little tall but then you also have that convective airflow hopefully then you're getting more use out of that right um i would have to say that the that the big thing is the like i think that the big thing that we added with this cob is 
we absorbed more heat and it's a type of heat absorption that will last longer than the, than the pebbles. The pebbles the pebbles are going to hold heat but they're going to give it off fairly quickly. The big rocks that are in there with the pebbles are going to hold it for a while but then they don't absorb as much because they're getting heated with convective heat instead of getting heated with conductive heat. So I think that what we're doing is we're making this system that'll hold heat longer and it'll 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 harvest more. Now, um, I think that the big thing with this whole experiment that for this whole this whole project, I mean, first of all, it's like this whole system needed an upgrade. It was an early prototype of a pebble style rocket mass heater. And it's like, OK, some of these experiments were all done with. Let's clear those out and put them away and get them out of here. They're not doing us any good. We have new experiments we want to try. And I think that the big, big thing that, that this project, this particular build was all about was how do we have even more efficiency when there is no fire? So the fire is done and now we want the system to become passively more efficient um, for the next day when there's no fire during that period. And I think that this is an area for which there hasn't been enough new innovation for rocket mass heater stuff. I think I could be wrong. I'm excited about it. I, I don't know if I'm on to something good or onto something stupid, um, but we did it. You guys did it. You guys did the work. The experiment is happening. Um, and, and so far, I think that the results are good. We got, you know, it does seem like the system is working more efficiently. And when we run the fire, it seems to have a stronger draw. Now, any, any more comments about the build? Is there any other little bits and bobs that, that I've left out? I know that uh, during the build, in order to be able to get the kiss the barrel to happen, that the, uh, the shippable core was moved closer to the mass about i think six yeah. or seven inches and yeah. uh having so i'm the guy that built that shippable core and there were it took four of us to move it into the building and place it there and i gotta tell you for four of us it was a grunt fest it was uh that is heavy <laughs> it's like uh, uh we called it a shippable core but it's like uh more like wow. freightable core. <laughs> it's like, uh, no, yeah, I don't think you want to ever ship that. That's going to be uh, very expensive to ship. And you're going to need a forklift to get it on the truck, I think. So, but it was heavy. You guys moved it like six or seven inches. Um, any other comments about the build before we just turn this over to Peter for his commentary about what we did? Yeah, so... We we added a metal sheet um, between the wooden box and the stratification chamber barrel. And then we also had a clean out at the back of the box. Um, uh, not sure how to describe that more, but <laughs> but but near the exterior door. OK, there we go. Yep, there it yep, is. There, you go. there it is. Okay with a yeah. door to access it. So it's low in the barrel? Yeah. 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 Okay, it's low. Good. So that way you can get to whatever chunky bits are laying in the bottom of the barrel. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So um, now uh, along those lines when you guys were taking out the ducting that was in there. So this thing had been run for 9 years. And even though there were clean out ducts on that end for all of this stuff, I don't think anybody ever went in and actually cleaned it out. How bad was it and what was in there? I don't recall there being that much stuff in there. Um, I think there was a little bit of, of fly ash in there. 
but I I have no strong memories of being like, oh my god, this thing's blocked. Um, it was just like, man, yeah, there's stuff in here. What do you know? Mm, you know, guess what? A fire's been burning. It made ash. Some of it got in here. Eh, okay, and and we went on. Um, so yeah, it was it was quite clean. I think Elliot was right on the money there. I I agree with that. Oh. Okay. So Stephen's trying to say stuff, but Stephen, Adam. there's something wrong with your microphone. We can't really understand anything you're saying. <laughs> try, try Sorry, again. Stephen. Okay. Let's let's uh, let's while Stephen looks at his stuff to yeah. Let's let's. I wanna check check check. Check. Oh, yeah. Check. That's now better. We can hear you. All right. Um, the thing I wanted to say is that I've been using this uh, rocket heater for uh, over a year now, and I have yet to see any kind of drop in efficiency, which would clue me in that we need to clean out from that exhaust. So I don't think there's been too much of a problem with stuff collecting inside of that exhaust. So uh, as far as I can tell, you know, based on my anecdotal experience, um, there's been very little buildup of uh, residue, ash, uh, you know, like a cinder, grease coat, or anything inside this particular heater. I wouldn't. I don't think we have to worry about that right now. It seems like I, about once a year in the past we've popped off the barrel, and then we would vacuum around the riser, and kind of shove the vacuum hose into the uh, manifold a little bit, and that was about it. And uh, and while there would be a fair bit of ash there, it wasn't like something like a bizarre amount or anything, but there was some. But yeah. it might I, be about I, time to do it. I Alex. recall when we were trying to get the stratification chamber, chamber barrel to sit on the manifold because it was wet cob, we were getting trace smoke trails and so uh, we had to kind of create a little bit of the the silt inside to like seal the interior of the ch of the chamber. Okay. So, I think we've said everything we can about what we did and what we observed and why we did it and the design. And um, and Peter's over there. I could see him taking notes. He's writing down all the things he needs to say. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> all right. All right, Peter. Let us have it. What do you think of all this stuff we did? Okay. Um, the input in the strut barrels. Uh, stratification is a long word. I call it strut barrels. Um, where is it situated? situated? Uh, is it in the bottom, in the top, or where is it? I can see it now. It's at the bottom. And, and it, it, it it's goes in late, low, low in the then, bottom, and it's an eight-inch duct that goes to the far end of the of the strat okay, barrel. Okay, yes, and then the uh, the pipe, the six-inch exhaust pipe, is going into the barrel to the where? Top. To the top. It's, I I think it's about. I'm going to guess at the moment about six inches from the bottom of the barrel. Yeah, but that there, the eight inch pipe is there as well. Yeah. There, and I side by side. Yeah. I side, have, by, <laughs> side by side by side then. Okay. I have three inches at the deeper part of the straw. Okay. Oh, I call the plunger pipe and you, uh, the straw. I call it the, the I, juice I, box I, straw. Use box straw. <laughs> yeah, I, I know what's meant for this. Um, yeah, yeah. Here in the United States, so, when we and, say and plunger, the, we get this whole other vision of something yeah, which doesn't yeah, yeah. fit. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't sound good. Other people has um, uh, other term terminology. So um, let's say, and the the straw is down there with six inch or five inch. But it's it's hollow there, so uh, you can't. Ha it's not flat. Right. The bottom of the of the strut barrels. I guess like forty five degree angle. 
and it's going yeah. down like this. So, so it like used this. to be, yeah. I think it originally was a 45 degree angle with the barrel like this. Yeah. And then I think we switched it around so that way it could, it was more open. Open. To pulling oh, out wait, the bottom, wait a minute. It, it's not. It's not a straight pipe, but uh, a 45 degree uh, angle on the elbow. I think so. Okay. Uh, no, he's Isaac. referring to the pipe is the pipe is straight. We're referring to the bottom. It's not cut at a 90 degree. Originally, it was cut at an angle to match the contour of the barrel, but then they rotated it. Oh, that's good. So the entrance of the pipe is larger than six inch. Yes. Yes, 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 That's definitely. I was, I was thinking maybe when you have a, a, a straight piece of pipe straw down to the bottom of the barrel, uh, it might be too small and you need, um, uh, let's say, a reducer to eight inch. So it's a wider uh, perimeter so the air can go easier under it from all around but you don't need it now because the pipe is cut in the 45 degrees and it's open to the rest of the barrel yes good yeah. uh, uh, the chimney temperature is that monitored in the in the library do you know what chimney temperature is uh, in the core of the chimney pipe when it's running we were just getting the surface temperature of the exhaust which is no, just the surface wall. temperature yeah, yeah that, that's that's the wall of the pipe yeah yeah and, uh, i usually add 30 degrees in these yeah, that's, things that's 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 Sometimes that's correct and sometimes it's not. Right. Um, but let's say that's that's correct uh, in uh, a couple of situations. Then the core, uh, in order to understand the, uh, how it uh, gases, hot gases behave in a uh, in a vertical duct. In the center, there's a uh, the pipe is this wide. And in the center is a hot, fast streaming core. And in built in layers, it's vertical, but I have to show it like this. Um, it's built in layers. Every layer is lower in temperature and slower in velocity. So laminar flow, right? The laminar flow, it goes right up. And the closer to the wall, the slower it gets. And the last tenth of a millimeter, it's effectively, effectively, effectively <laughs> at standstill. This is called the boundary layer. A smaller pipe, the boundary layer is earlier and closer to the fast streaming core. And with a wider pipe, it's larger but farther away from the, uh, from the from the from the core of the of the pipe so this is how it works um what I think this, is a, <clears throat> this is a big reason why we went with the smaller vertical exhaust yeah. is, is is for exactly the thing that you're describing and yeah. and it's like okay when those gases are hot then they will you know they'll draw faster than if they are cold and once yep. they're cold it plugs kind of sort of a little bit not really but kind of sort of a little bit and so yeah um it's, it's and then it's like more but, friction. but we want it to to draw even stronger when there's a fire and so that's yeah. the whole kiss the barrel idea is to get those gases in there hotter yeah. Yeah. during the fire that works but what you did actually what what uh what got the the most bang for your buck is eliminating friction so the top gap uh, above the riser is larger 
So there is less friction to go the 180 degrees the change direction. The strap barrels uh, has less um, less friction than a, a, a double banded pipe. Uh, so in the barrel itself, barrels itself, the gas velocity goes down and more heat tend to go up in those barrels. So that's the efficiency of such a system. Then the plunger pipe uh, I was talking about was, sorry, I noted <laughs> plunger pipe. <laughs> straw, the straw? Straw, straw. The juice okay. box straw. Straw. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. That's great. The straw pipe. Um, uh, I was worried about the bottom gap, but there is actually no bottom gap. And by cutting it uh, in the 5 to 5 degrees, is even better. So. There, there is a gap there from the bottom of the straw. So the yeah. lowest point of the straw, there is a three inch gap. Initially, yeah, but the, the, rest, the, rest, the rest is, uh, is 45 degrees yeah. and open, yeah. nothing in front of it. Right. Correct? That's correct. And uh, Peter, we did fiddle with that. We played a little bit because when we first mm -hmm. tried having the 45 facing the side of the barrel that seemed to be too restrictive um, yeah, on the flow and yeah. so then we just tried rotating it uh 90 degrees so that it faced the end of the barrel and thus the source of the exhaust um and that was better but it and help me out here um isaac and alex i think that the problem we found was that it wasn't starting well and we, by raising it up that three inches, it started better. I don't know that it made any real difference to the draw once it was going, but that was a concession to making it faster at the start time. Maybe, maybe when you, uh, it was first um, facing the wall of the barrel, when you turned it around 180 degrees, it would be better even because it's free air there. Where the air is coming from, it's not important. Right. It, it's just that that's the way it ended up, I think. Yeah. Um, okay. And I also, we did try to convince Paul that what we should do is have a an adjustable straw that we could low up and down. So you could mm -hmm. raise it up for starting and then lower it down. But then no, Paul no, no, said... No. No, uh, human, human errors. No, 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 no. Paul, Paul was right about that. Really, human errors. Somebody, and somebody, note oh, this timestamp so I can re play that back five or six yeah, times. Yeah, okay. You like to hear that, yes? Um, uh, all the system I built, I never had a bypass. I never have a, a, a chimney guillotine or whatever. Uh, and because such a system, the higher the stratification chamber and the lower the exhaust, the more heat stays up, logically. Actually, high and narrow works actually the best. Not easily done, but it works actually best because a larger part is higher above uh, the exhaust. But okay. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Outdoor air. Oh, about uh, changing from 8 inch to 4 inch. That's not. Uh, that's about a quarter. So the four inch is in cross section area a quarter of the eight inch. So that's much, much too far. The six inch is uh, a little bit more than half the eight inch in cross section area. So actually, you are lucky it works. Uh, 
I would say a seven inch, but probably not easy to come by. Let me uh, let me remind you of a conversation we had several years ago when you were last here, <clears throat> and that is uh, yeah. That's the, when. What year was that? Oh, oh boy, yeah, well, oh, well, 2017 oh, maybe. Uh, but okay. Uh, okay. What, yeah. <laughs> we were sitting at the, inside the Fisher Price House, you and I, and I proposed the idea of a four-inch vertical exhaust for this eight inch rocket mass heater, which is actually um, the wood feed on it is shrunk down so much that it's actually more like a six inch wood feed. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> the one thing I said is, is that if we were uh, uh, burning a four inch batch box, uh -huh. the amount of exhaust gases that would be coming out of that would be about the same as what's in an eight inch J tube. No, no, no. Six inch. Well, uh, it's going to burn. A four inch is about half a six inch. So and, uh, what I found out in during the years that uh, a batch box, uh, according to uh, the best rocket left website, uh, is about twice as pow powerful as a J tube of the same diameter, more or less, give or take, whatever. But you would uh, burn four times more wood at once. Yeah, but it's um, the output of this is because it's uh, done in a batch. You need a larger stratification chamber to extract enough heat. Yeah, because it has a, high, a much higher burn rate. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, as long as you for for every pound you have the same efficiency, and I know it has, then uh, the overall efficiency is only uh, different when the uh, the chimney temperature is higher. That's on the, the same burning uh, combustion eff is efficiency is the same burning efficiency pound for pound. You can't do anything about it. It's numbers. Right. That's all. I think I, I think okay. that the big thing is is that uh, with four inch vertical exhaust, we were just bumping up on far too much laminar flow. We just couldn't. We we our exhaust temperatures were not hot enough to be able to work with a four inch vertical exhaust. If our exhaust temperatures were like 300 degrees, a four inch vertical exhaust would be fine. But when we're trying to keep our exhaust temperatures under 160, then it's like, it just got, there's just too much laminar flow. Um, yeah. And so in the end, uh, we're doing pretty good with a six inch system where we do kiss the barrel. That's been my experience so far, and it sounds like you're agreeing with this. Mm. And, uh, Depends on what the temperature in that six-inch pipe would be. Oh yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. All right. Uh, but I think what yeah. we measure the outside, we're seeing uh, temperatures of about uh, 120 to 140, and which it's probably a, a fair bit warmer than that on the inside but yeah but you know that's going to be the laminar temperature too and that's like that's still pretty good especially if the temperature outside is hovering around freezing then we're going to yeah. have a nice strong draw which yeah, is another yeah, yeah. thing too um i don't know if you saw the free heat movie or the youtube videos that we put out about it especially the one about cold Mo plugs. most of them most of them so the cold plug thing, to me, it's been a big, big, big thing. Because so often we make these systems to work really well in a house. Mm -hmm. And then we are like all angry when they work so poorly in a cabin or a shop or in a teepee or something like that. So um, we, are, we have now found that if we hang a sign next to it to talk about cold plug, and how to how to mitigate a cold plug, suddenly the whole system works 10 times better just by hanging a piece of paper next to it. 
Uh, uh, there, there is something uh, other with that. Um, what I did here in in our house, uh, the heater is behind me. Uh, it's just a cupboard made of concrete. Actually, heat resistant oh. concrete. But okay. okay. Uh, so you could open it up and a, get a little fire going in it. Yeah, it's yeah. about uh, two feet uh, width inside square and as high as a, as a full grown man, uh, 1.8 yards. And um, <laughs> <laughs> it's better to do it in yards. <laughs> um, why don't you do that? But um, the and the exhaust is down low on one side with a uh, with a trumpet like uh, uh, entrance to the, to the chimney pipe. So actually, the inside is eight inch, and it goes down in the thickness of that wall to uh, uh, to six inch. Uh, the thing is, uh, what is it? Two metric tons about. Uh, that's about two, four, two, two and a half uh, US tons. And um, it's virtually frictionless. So you start it up and it goes, cold or not. And what you have done, you have uh, eliminating friction in the system you have. But probably there are somewhere pipes in there is not very good. Actually, what you uh, would think over the opening between the strut chamber and the barrel, the vertical barrel, should be not a pipe, but as wide as you can, much, much wider. Because there's a pipe there. It needs to go all through the pipe, through the pipe to the end, and then it goes free in the stretch chamber. So leave the pipe out, leave that out, leave that out, and make it wide. That is what uh, why what I uh, try to advocate. I think that making it wide at that point. <clears throat> yeah. is good to have a stronger draw. Uh, and, better start up. And then there's the whole concept of being able to prime the vertical exhaust, which is mm. what I think you're describing, to be able to get no, a little fire going in that vertical it, it, exhaust. It, it, it's even stronger than that. Uh, the pipe behind, uh, at the side of uh, my heater here, uh, is about two foot away from the from the side of the heater so the pipe won't heat up at all not kissing the wall of the heater at all but it goes anyway so what i say is when you make it the whole system frictionless then you've got a better draw just from the start you don't have to kiss the barrel or whatever. But it's a way to eliminate, kissing the barrel is a way to eliminate possible friction points in the rest of the system. That's a good thing, yes. Well, it can't, it can't be without. And I'm trying to do something that is very, very different from that. And oh. I've got my crazy reasons. And, and, yeah. and, and my crazy goes like this. <clears throat> this is the thing where I, I want to take advantage of the laminar flow issue. Mm -hmm. I, when, the, when the fire is not burning, I want it. I want the air to not go up the exhaust. I want it to plug. I want it. I want it to plug as it won't plug completely. I'll never no. get it entirely, but I'll get a little bit. 
And 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 the, with that little bit comes a little bit more efficiency. And so the 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 thing that we are attempting to do with this experiment is how to make the the whole system more efficient when there is not a fire. And that means that more of the heat from the mass goes into the room rather than up the exhaust. Because mm -hmm. if it's if that exhaust is frictionless as you describe it, mm -hmm. then a bunch of heat that's in my mass wants to go up the exhaust and outside uh, instead uh, of no. warming me. No. No. Just oh. no. Because okay. it's a stratification chamber. The stratification chamber is what it's is doing what it says is it's doing. It uh, traps the hot air in the top of the chamber. Yes. And it that's it. That is a passive uh, chimney valve. Or, yeah, uh, it is. Shut off valve or guillotine or whatever. You are you are correct, sir. I agree with your analysis, one hundred percent. I just want to add one thing to what you just said yeah. while everything you said is is true it's not perfectly true i i, I oh i just wanted to make a note that it was true but no, not perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> so it'll plug but the plug that it does is plug-ish mm. and and so then there's also a similar plug happening uh over the riser right mm -hmm. you know and so there's a little bit of plug there which is also plug-ish it's not a perfect plug no and the stratification chamber is not a perfect plug mm -hmm. and this smaller vertical exhaust plugs but it's not a perfect plug either mm -hmm. and so the idea is we're going to add all these up to a pretty damn good plug whereas what we had before was just a good plug yeah yeah uh, I can I can see the reason for it, and I see the, uh, that the the whole of the system is now as good as it gets without other uh, radical modifications. I think so. So you can probably get one or two percent or maybe five or something uh more and that's about it do you want to do that uh, uh what i would say is uh if the numbers are your you are mentioned are right for the uh vertical exhaust then uh you have a very good efficiency, overall efficiency, probably somewhere around 90%, which is very high. Yeah, yeah. I So your strategy of having a much taller stratification chamber, that makes yeah. great sense. You'll have a better plug that way too. However, yeah. the, the heat that you're giving off is going to be closer to the ceiling, um, which uh. is which you know isn't so great which no no uh, wait, wait a minute that that's that's with a barrel but the thing behind me is not a barrel there is no metal in there oh yeah 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 no 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 except for yeah. the door it, it's it's all masonry so so which where, means uh, in, right? in, in uh five four or five hours after being fired the whole of the thing is about the same temperature from so, top to bottom 10 degrees or something. Trying, trying to focus on the build that we just did, yeah. that we're talking about here. Um, and and granted, there are other designs that, that yeah. one can do. And, <laughs> uh, and, and, and speaking of which, I wonder if Andreas, if you could pull up that picture of the Cobb hat. Uh, I'm excited. So, so Peter, you built, if we're going to talk about a different design, you built the Minnie Mouse that's up inside the Love Shack. And uh, 
uh, we, we've had some people using that and that's been delightful. And we've been um, kind of thinking like we'd like it to be warmer in the morning. And mm -hmm. so, of course, the mass that's inside of Minnie Mouse is pretty minimal. It is. Yeah, it is. And so it's kind of like, okay, how could we add more mass? We have a lot of ideas, but, uh, and I'm hoping Andreas will put a picture of it up here really soon. Um, mm, I, I've seen the YouTube uh, video. Well, we haven't, we're, we're, yeah. we're, we are just now starting to put together a YouTube video about the cob, what we call it the cob hat. And um, uh, mud, we have Mud hat one. Mud hat I, one. And so there's, uh, I think, I think Stephen has put up some pictures uh, mm. on on permies, but uh, uh, for the most part, what it is is that um, we have a 14-inch thick mm. cob blob that mm. hovers over. There it is. There it is. Yep. Hovers over the barrel. So we don't want the cob to touch the top of the barrel because that could lead to the barrel possibly spalling. Yep. We don't want that. So uh, this is basically attempting to harvest the radiant heat coming off of the top of the barrel to put it into the cob hat. So that cob hat is 14 inches thick. And uh, this, is this is an experiment. Oh, and the opening, I believe, is designed to facilitate any pizzas or pies or cookies that might need baking kind of yeah. a second purpose. But, but really it's like the idea is that the heat that gets in there can come out the front. Um, and we don't want it to get too hot. So we got to mm -hmm. keep that open. But at the same time, rather than trying to heat a mass to say 110 degrees Fahrenheit, is like, what if we could heat it up to about 250 or 300 degrees Fahrenheit? And then it'll hold that heat longer. So um, mm. I believe Stephen is about to do some fresh tests with this, but we've, uh, we've, we've modified it a bit and I think it's now ready for the full, for the full testing. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but yeah, we had some people that were staying there and when they would report the numbers of like, I'm going to bed and it's 85, and in the morning it's 60. And I'm I'm kind of thinking that's too too cold. Uh, I would rather that they go to bed and it's 75 and they wake up and it's 65. I think that would be better. And so we're trying to find ways to add a mass. Now uh, we've got some other ideas about other masses to add and things of that nature, but but this is our first uh, we were we're the most excited about this design. And uh, we might just, we're so excited about this, we might just start sticking this on everything. Um, <laughs> because it's like, why heat the ceiling? Nobody's up there. And then you get like, the, the ceiling will get to be like 200 degrees because it's harvesting all that radiant heat. And then you just end up melting the snow on the roof and in this one spot. And it's like, that's not, that's not doing us any good. But adding a cob hat onto everything, um, onto, onto every rocket mass heater, would give it a much longer uh, burn. Although we have made something similar for the bun warmer outside, but that's just so that we can make pizzas. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. Let's uh, let's let's look towards possibly uh, going to some questions and wrapping this up. But but I want to make sure, Peter, do you have anything else to say about this build in the library, this stuff that we did in the library? Um, most of the uh, boxes are ticked. Okay. Uh, the friction elimination of the friction is the um, is the most important, in my opinion, of course. Uh, the top cap above the riser could be more than four inches, but okay. Uh, there is a, a little formula uh, how to uh, calculate that. Um, let's say uh, it's an imaginary ring above the riser. And the You're surface area... The 
the cross-sectional yeah. area the, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah the surface area of the ring should be ideally twice the cross-section area of the riser oh okay because i think at an inch and a half it is the cross-sectional area so three yes. inches would be the minimum that would be the minimum yeah, and fascinating, fascinating. I know we're going for a bigger gap these days yeah. um, because having a nice strong draw really makes a rocket mass heater, you know, delightful. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Cool. How so, about this? Uh, okay. Do you have any other notes about this build? Uh, this is a, well. The way I put a couple of questions. Uh, oh, there's one more uh two more uh the rocks on uh in cop uh, lasagna uh is a, a very good strategy to extract more heat by conduction you're right about it you note that down and um <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, and there is a little warning um fly us in the uh, ash in the strap barrels will be probably more than fly us in the pipes. No, I, I explain. Um, uh, fly is, is, is very light ash and it uh, will be uh, actually behaving ah. as a gas. So when, uh, when you have pipes, even wider pipes, uh, the uh, the fly ash will carry all the way to the chimney and goes out. Now you have a smaller chimney. The reasons have been discussed, okay. Um, and uh, there is no pipe anymore. There is a big stratification chamber. In the stratification chamber, the forward velocity of gases goes down until the point up to the point where the fly ash will sink down there mm, so you have to be aware there will be probably more fly ash which doesn't carry out to outside but stays in the barrels okay that's good to know that, that makes perfect sense makes perfect sense good okay so are we ready to go on to q a um I, I'm not sure if people have been like watching all of the comments. I've seen some with bright colors. I think that people have paid little monies to get some. Uh, let's see, it says, I, I see a thing on the screen. It says, I really hope you'll live stream the recording of the Rich Soil podcast to your YouTube channel. So that way there can also be audience interaction. Isn't that what we're doing right now? I think this 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 whole thing that we're doing is uh, is on YouTube live right now, and I think it's on some other things live. I don't know what yeah. else. I but think that's a vote vote of confidence. He likes this. It likes He's this like, format. do this. Okay. He gave you monies to say how much he liked it. So I hope you'll rename Skip to Bypass. And then he's got it's an acronym. The name Skip scares people off. <laughs> maybe i don't know i i i've gotten to where i really like skip i mean it used to be pep but then it grew and grew and grew and now now peter's looking confused peter you're probably not familiar with the skip stuff that we've done yeah okay so um uh it, I'll, I'll keep it in mind but i think uh i i think step one is to have all of the skip stuff get to be uh a thousand times more interest to folks and then we can talk uh mark is this i'm i i see you know there's a mark in our in our uh uh group here and then there's the mark there. i think it's i think it's our mark uh, but see the cob hat might make it tough to clean the system though good point. Ooh, that is a good point if the system is designed so that you pop the barrel off in order to clean it the cob hat would make that challenging that's true i don't i don't have an answer for that one but if the whole so for example peter's mini mouse that's up inside of uh, the love shack 
um, <clears throat> that's enough of a gap that uh, I actually think about maybe we'll take the Minnie Mouse out and put something else in there. But uh, with the Cobb hat, I think we could end up with a successful system. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of feel like um, this is, you know, it, it might make it more challenging to clean. It is true. But we also don't have to build a whole new rocket mass heater either. So um, I think it's been an experiment that is reaching success. It's the only four inch system we still have. And it's the only one that has a metal core. And uh, uh, I, nope. I'm a very... What? No, nope, no, no. Only part of the feed tube is metal. The rest is um, heat resistant concrete. So I think, I think that the... I know the wood feed is definitely steel. Yeah. A and part I think, of it. The top part of it. And I think that the burn tunnel is also steel. Nope. Not no. at all. Okay. All right. Not at all. All right. I know that the riser is vermiculite board. Yep. Yeah. And so, but you're saying that the burn tunnel is a type of uh, refractory cement? Huh. Yep. Okay. I guess I haven't dug so into it enough. Where all, where all the burning takes place is refractory cement. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. And Good. The, uh, the, uh, uh, actually, e everything that's on the level of the burn tunnel, the, so part of the riser and part of the fit tube, is refractory. So that's it. I'm going to say, so there's a question here. Do you think four inch work for a six inch system? I, I got to say that um, we're not going to do any more four inch systems here. No. That's, and that's my opinion. And, um, uh, you know, it's possible to get a four inch system to work well, but it is hard. It's challenging. And then on top of that, if nothing else, like a four inch J tube, kind of like what we're talking about up at the Love Shack. Mm -hmm. When the time comes to get the ash out, my hand does not fit down. And no. I've got, of course, kind of giant hands, but my hand doesn't no. fit down the wood feed to get the ash out. So there's uh, ways to do it, but it's like it's, you got to um, have something there to get yeah. that ash out. Yes, Peter? Comment. Um, the, is there any ash in the wood feed? I would imagine so. Yeah, look at there's Stephen. You say yes. There, is there in the bird tunnel, Stephen? Oh, is you're muted. He's either muted or his microphone is wonky. He yeah. is not muted. It's his microphone. Okay. Um, uh, said I can't <laughs> understand it. <laughs> Peter, we can't hear you. Oh, it's, it's just a thin layer that's what i understand a thin layer of ash there okay you understand um uh, the whole idea of that optimized youtube was not to plug it with ashes in a normal youtube the uh it's plugged by ashes at the back at the riser uh end and but because there is a a, a, a sort of sk ski ramp going up there it's uh going in the direction of where the gases go and only a small patch of ash uh will stay at the bottom of the ramp just a bit and that's it i think that's the uh, that's the bit you you uh, mentioned, Stephen. So there's a, okay. a question here about a uh, a four inch exhaust for a six inch system. Uh, I want you to go watch the movie Free Heat. I think it's at freeheat.info. Um, it's possible that Andreas um, can put a link up. But uh, the thing is, is we tried that and it didn't do well. Um, uh, and so 
So now we don't do a four inch exhaust on anything. The laminar flow is too much. No. Uh, yeah, you got a, a six inch is the smallest you can do. Uh, you could possibly do a five inch exhaust on a six inch system uh, if you're doing the kiss the barrel thing, but we just went straight for six. But if you look at that movie, um, uh, the free heat movie, we put we we tested a lot of different things trying to use four inch exhaust and in the end we're just dropping all four inch exhaust um all right here's something that says uh what would you think about 3d printing with clay fiber uh an over-engineered organic alien dyson shaped stove uh like some kind of turbojet tornado thing but made out of natural materials only um Not i don't work. yeah i don't think it's gonna work i don't no. think it's gonna work i mean the rocket mass heater stuff works because of the materials that we use next to the fire can handle temperatures over 2000 degrees but uh uh the material the you know it's not the same we we use specialized materials for that um so i'm gonna let it go um question for peter you have built rocket mass heaters in the netherlands question mark yeah, i did uh, can excursions be organized to see them uh you can see this one behind me <laughs> and, and, and there is another one uh, experiment in the in the workshop uh, behind that wall here. Uh, but actually, I didn't uh, do much of building. Actually, I uh, do a lot of experiments, and I break them down and use the materials again, so they are not here anymore. So I. Uh, uh, at home, I have two rocket mass heaters, one here and one there. That's it. This uh, next question is, is the exhaust a continuous metal pipe? Yes. I am yeah. wondering how far cold conducts down the exhaust when the fire is out and what effect that has on airflow. That is an excellent question. Yep. And I know that for uh, the Fisher Price house, um, we have an eight inch exhaust and there have been times when it was cold enough outside that we were seeing frost in the house on that duct, uh -huh. on that stove pipe, which is part of why I think that if we shrink it down to six inches, that the cold conduction from the outside to the inside is going to be reduced. Uh, yeah. And so that's another reason to shrink the, the, the size of the vertical exhaust. All right. Uh, do we have some more? OK, here's another one. Uh, with rocket mass heaters, has anyone actually tried to heat their house with trash in the spirit of permaculture produced no waste? So, yeah, I tell a story frequently where Ianto Evans heated his home with nothing but junk mail for an entire <laughs> winter. And so, yes, yes, it can be done. Now, here uh, we tend to use cardboard boxes. We get a lot of stuff shipped here. And I know that uh, uh, the problem is, is that you get bored burning cardboard boxes. Look, there's there's Steven. He's going to do it now. Quick demonstration. But we have uh, stuff that arrives here in cardboard boxes, which we use to heat our spaces. But I, I confess that we get quickly bored of sitting there feeding cardboard in. It's easier to put some wood in so you can walk away for 20, 30 minutes. Ever consider testing a Tesla valve for the chimney? No. Ooh, 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 ooh. Oh, maybe <laughs> Peter has. No, but no. I know what a, I know what a Tesla valve is. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, too much friction. Well, and then it's like you know we're back to that whole thing of like why not just have a cork, you know? And it's like and then the whole problem yeah. we have the cork. 
So it's, um, it is very complicated to build that right, the Tesla valve. And actually, we are not up to making it co more complicated. We are up to less complicated, right? That is true. That is true. So I uh, love the lives. Keep doing them. Uh, we'll see what we can do. This does seem to be working out pretty good. Um, Okay, do we have any more questions at this time or is it's probably time to wrap up? I know my bladder is saying that we are at the end of this event. <laughs> so uh, anybody else got anything else to add? I just, just as a beginner question, instead of people sitting on that bench in the library, it looks like there's a wood uh, storage unit on top of it. Yeah, we've been- So you're harvesting storage. that heat to dry your wood? I think the firewood we've been putting on it is already pretty dry, but but sure, yeah, uh, it's it's drying it to some degree, um, a little bit more. I mean, if it gets drier, it'll burn better. But uh, um, I don't. If if any of the wood was a little green, it would probably dry it out pretty quick. But uh, I don't know. It's just been a nice wood rack, nice place to keep it mm -hmm. um, over the mass. Um, let's see. And, and um, Stephen, hasn't there been like a, a closed drying rack there as well at times? Over the one in the Fisher Price house, there's a closed drying rack. Okay, but I thought, okay, on a, maybe. On a pulley. And then on the one in the solarium, there's, yeah, see, okay. towards the solarium, we have one on a pulley. And so you, uh, uh, you put on the clothes drying rack and then you pull up. There's two, there's two clothes drying racks. So Steven's doing two. There's two in there near that rocket mass heater in the solarium. So it's multifunction. It both heats, it dries your clothes and subsequently it humidifies the air as well. Very important. <laughs> That's true. Um, is the, uh, so let's see, our furnace is out uh, five, negative five last night, and the part is $550. Is there a sane way to get a rocket mass heater going quick and easy? And um, I just want to say that somehow I am talking to people who are designing shippable cores for sale. And I believe that one of these shippable cores will be available in the United States. It's an eight inch shippable core. It'll be available in the United States soon. You can buy a Liberator, which is a four inch shippable core. Um, the, uh, the Liberator's wood feet is small. So it's kind of like uh, it, it works well in a home where you're going to keep your home warm. But uh, we tried using the Liberator in the wood shop and people were frustrated because you would put as much fire in it as you can for four hours and it didn't warm the space up enough. And so that's why we have that new batch box rocket mass heater in there. Oh, and I'm gonna say a thing that will make Peter happy because Peter was very angry with me when I recorded a podcast about batch box. Yeah. And I was very sour on Batchbox. And he was he became very angry with me for a long time. But I, I want to say, I want to make it perfectly clear. Uh, one of the things I said in there, and I stand by, is if you're going to build a rocket mass heater, your first rocket mass heater should be a J-tube. Don't take on a Batchbox for your first build. A batch box build is going to be about three times more sophisticated. I'm, I think. I'm going to add the words I think, and then Peter can say a different number later. But <laughs> uh, uh, I think it's about, and I think to learn rocket mass heater stuff, learn with a J tube. And when uh -huh. you've built three J tube rocket mass heaters, I think then you're ready to build your first batch box. I think one of the big flaws I see with batch box is too many people shoot going for batch box in their first build. Like, oh yeah, other people should build three first, but not me, I'm brilliant and smart. And so I'm gonna start <laughs> with batch box. And then, they, and then they end up with a freak show of flaming death instead of a rocket mass heater. And they're, they feel like all rocket mass heaters suck. And that makes me sad. 
Um, I do want to say for almost all homes, a J tube is probably best. And if you're talking about a shop or a cabin and a cabin, you allow to go stone cold and, uh, and now you got to heat it up fast. A J tube just is going to be so slow. It's going to take a long, long time to get that. Cause you're going to start off stone cold and then you're going to be like, I want it to be 70 degrees in here right away. Fahrenheit. I got to say Fahrenheit cause Peter's here, but, uh, uh, and it's like, I want it to be comfortable right away. I don't want to wait six hours. And so a batch box is going to, um, use 4.3 times more wood. And so it's going to, 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 to warm everything up 4.3 times faster. And uh, so, so here you can see inside of a shop, we're using the triple barrel design, which Peter was the first one to teach me that. We're using a triple barrel design. So instead of there being a mass, there's, there's three barrels to extract the heat quickly and there's no mass. And so it'll heat a shop much faster. And then when you leave the shop and the fire goes out, the tools don't care that it's getting cold suddenly. You know, uh, the, the mass is good for when there's going to be people in the house uh, sleeping and they want to stay warm through the night. So a cabin is still going to be a rocket mass heater, but a batch box would be wise for a cabin because... You could get the, the cabin uh, temperature up 4.3 times faster than you can with a J tube. Mm -hmm. And then because there's a mass, you can maintain the temperature in the cabin over the time that you're in the cabin. So, all right, Peter, I'm saying that a batch box will heat a space 4.3 times faster, but the trade-off is it is a three times more sophisticated build. Yep. Now you're going to have different numbers than me, probably. What would be your <laughs> number choices? Um, it depends on um, one of the things are um, a batch box can run without a door. Uh, no, nobody seems to know that, but uh, I've built a couple of open systems and uh, the ones that are measured. Uh, two or three, um, the overall efficiency was a bit lower, uh, let's say three or five percent. That was it. It ran beautifully without a door. But you have to stay in, 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 the, in the neighborhood because if I could fall out, uh, you, uh, you can't close it up uh for the night or something like that so uh that's why i was fond of the uh, of the door uh what do, what do you call this door oh the uh the this door is the plug door plug style door oh i love it. it it yeah. is, it makes the build so much simpler yep and yep. uh you just need a place to be able to park the door when you when you move it off of the hole yeah but yeah. your idea of a batch box rocket mass heater without a door and you have a, des a successful design mm -hmm. you telling me that publicly in this format gives me a stomach ache <laughs> and the reason is is that um i've heard of people more than once, like more than, I think three times where people have been someplace where somebody started to build a batch box style rocket mass heater, but they, they didn't think about the door. Uh -huh. And so they hadn't built a door yet. And then they left. And then somebody said that there is a rocket mass heater. And then somebody would try to put a fire in it and they haven't finished building it yet. And then the smoke pours out the front of it. And they're like, all rocket mass heaters suck because smoke pours out the front of them. Yep. And, and it's like, so I keep ending up having to fight on that front. Like that is an, in, that is, it's like, 
trying to drive a car that doesn't have a steering wheel. All cars <laughs> suck. They just go into the ditch. This is stupid. All cars are stupid. And yes. it's like, no, you're just trying to drive one that doesn't have a steering wheel. Well, somebody told me it was a car. I got uh -huh. in. I made it go. So why did it go into the ditch? This is dumb. And it's like, uh, so I, I just kind of feel like when people get excited about Batchbox and then they make a freak show of Flaming Death instead, whether it's because they didn't finish the job it's, or they, they innovated open, before, you know, knowing both, how to innovate. Well, an open fire is a freak show. Yes. That's a freak show. So and now we have, uh, uh, I think, four or five open uh, open batch boxes, but they are specifically built for that purpose to to be able to run without the door. So it's not for in a house. No, it's I get for, it. For outside on the terrace or something. I get it. I understand. Yeah. Fascinating, interesting, but, but and I can't the, help but think that I'm going to get. Well, I'm I'm rocket mass eaters as a whole are going to be poisoned by this lovely thing that you made. <laughs> right. Because, well, it's sort of like don't try this at home, kids. Right. I, yeah. I asked for this picture to come back up because this is a batch box, right? This is the yeah. batch box with the three barrels being built. Yeah. Look how complicated that is. Oh my yeah. God. You yeah. need you need a brick saw. You yeah. need to have all these angles right. You are cutting all of these bricks. My understanding, I am not an expert. I'm the newbie here. But my understanding is you can build a J2 batch box and you're not cutting a lot of bricks. And when you do, they're mm. not at angles like this. A J2 batch box doesn't exist. What do you <laughs> sorry, you can, sorry, I said that wrong. You can build a J2 rocket mass heater without yeah. doing a lot of brick cutting. Am I right? Yes, yeah. that is true. That Which is, is yeah. why Paul says build three J tubes before you go mucking around with the, you know, this is like, it. it's your first woodworking project and you're going to, you know, build just make something super complicated. Yeah. yeah. As, a, as a, you should build a wood box before you build a chest of drawers. Uh, yeah. Actually, I started, uh, uh, I started with something entirely else, but it looks uh, it, at the time it looked like uh, a full size masonry heater as used in Finland. And right. I know I knew what uh, brick cutting was and so on. Um, so for me, this is fairly easy, but it's for me, not for That's everybody. Right. Peter's a trained professional, folks. Yeah. Don't try sort this of. at home. Yeah, sort of. So I want to, you know, so I'm going on record as stating that um, batch box. And, and in fact, Peter, when you were here and you built that batch box, I think I couldn't shut up about how this changes everything. And this is going to be the, this is, everybody's going to do batch box from here on out. It is the best. And, and, uh, and it was because of people behaving poorly Um and, and then bashing all rocket mass heaters because they were thinking that this unfinished rocket mass heater uh, was, they were trying to use it as if it was finished and they were saying, this is terrible. So all rocket mass heaters suck. This, this mm -hmm. thing that I believe was setting back rocket mass heaters, that, that's where I became very, very frustrated with batch box. But I, I will gladly state that for, uh, a shop or a garage or a cabin. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons for having a batch or a batch box is definitely superior to a J tube. Um, and in that podcast that you were so upset about, I said, there is no way for a batch box to ever be as efficient as a J tube. And, and I have to withdraw that. I, I have to say that there is a way for a batch box to be even more efficient than a J-tube. And it has to do with the fact that you have to design the mass, the extraction, 
to extract, as you mentioned at the beginning of this recording, uh, to be much to extract much much more. But you can have your if you can get your exhaust temperatures down to like 140, which is what mm -hmm. we kind of shoot for with uh, J tube, then you have effectively been become more efficient than the J tube. Mm -hmm. But but there would have to be a lot more extraction happening. Uh, like the syst the extraction system would have to be more substantial in order for that no. to happen. So no. there, have I said the things to erase whatever uh, awfulness uh, from my past? <laughs> at, um, you're right. The um, a batch box uh, could be more efficient, could, could be more powerful and so on, but it's also more complicated. It's a trade-off. That's all there should say about it. Yeah. Um, which a rocket mass heater in general compared to a conventional wood stove, it's kind of the same story. Um, yeah. And the Achilles heel of a rocket mass heater, as much as there's people that say all these negative things about rocket mass heaters that are not true, the one thing that is true, they don't seem to even touch that. And that is the whole thing about the cold plug. With mm -hmm. with all this efficiency, the trade-off is the cold plug. And mm -hmm. so uh, having ways to mitigate a cold plug. And then the other thing is, is that if you're in a cabin or if you're uh, in a wood shop uh, or something like that, uh, a, an outdoor sauna, then um, you're going to have a cold plug every time you start it. Uh, which is a bit of a problem. But if you can have ways of mitigating the cold plug, you can get around that. And with a, a conventional wood stove, you don't you don't really have the cold. Well, you can still have the cold plug problem, but generally you don't because the fire is built right under the chimney. And so yeah. it's like, but with all this efficiency, the trade-off is the cold plug. So, um, all right. Anybody got anything else to add to this recording thingamabob? Have we, have we uh, replied to all the questions that came through? I haven't seen any more pop up on my screen here, so I'm guessing we're kind of done with that. So um, I'm going to say it. I'm going to do it. If you like this sort of thing, come on out to the <laughs> forum at permies.com where we talk about rocket mass heaters, homesteading, and permaculture. All, all the time. All the time. <laughs> <laughs> so long, farewell.